Lobos 90, Letourneau 58 is your final score. Welcome into the post-game show brought to you by Downs Racetrack and Casino. We hope to see you soon. Please continue to mask up and stay safe. Lobos defeat the Letourneau Yellow Jackets 90-58 to along with Lobo legend Hunter Green. I'm Robert Portnoy. New Mexico advances to 3-0 and and the final preparation for Boise State is complete. The Lobos uh, with three games over a five-day span on the campus of Rice University at Tudor Fieldhouse. Victories over host Rice and then the Lobos hosting games in the next two contests are Lady of the Lake and Letourneau and uh, New Mexico. These last two games blowout wins for UNM over an NAIA school and a Division three school. Hunter, uh, New Mexico was able to get everybody uh, into the game against 16. The Lobos did have available today both the San Enjai and Jordan Arroyo, uh, but Coach Weir uh, they just arrived to join the team yesterday. It was his plan not to play them today unless he needed to uh, because they haven't been able to practice with the team this week. They've been back in Albuquerque. So um, everybody that uh, that was available uh, got to play for the second straight game, and, and we saw especially those guys come off the bench there at the end uh, and, and get a lot of firsts in the books and seem to get more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the – the goal with these type of games is to try to get some uh, everyone some minutes, right? I mean, because you just never know with injuries and COVID um, who who you're going to have left. So uh, it was great to see, you know, uh, Marin and, and, and Dorsey out there and, and, and getting some minutes um, just to kind of get a feel for the game situation. Hey, Lobos, download, download the new Lobo Sports app today. Access exclusive content. It includes interviews with head football coach Danny Gonzalez, head basketball coaches Paul Weir and Mike Bradbury, and listen to live game broadcasts. You can keep up with the latest stats and scores and enter to win prizes and much more. The Lobo Sports app, it's free. It can be found on the Apple and the Google stores. Download now and go Lobos. Okay, we'll step aside, take our first post-game break. We've got Coach Weir to come and all the stats as well. Final score, New Mexico 90, Letourneau 58 from Houston. Lobo back. They're awaiting their reopened date at the Downs at Albuquerque. In the meantime, the Downs family reminds you, mask up, stay safe, and we hope to see you soon. Lobo's 90, Letourneau 58 is the final. New Mexico improves to 3-0. and Lobo head basketball coach Paul Weir joins us. Coach Weir, congratulations on uh, getting your first week of the season uh, uh, in the books. Three consecutive victories. Um, what was the first message to the team post game today, Coach, after the win over Letourneau? It was actually thank you. Um, it's been a it's been a long haul. We're kind of closing the the last page of this chapter. We're we're leaving Houston tomorrow, and we've been on a very very long journey. And and I, like I told them, we've had some different chapters along the way. We had the we've had an Albuquerque chapter, a, a Moriarty chapter, a, a Lubbock and Levelin chapter, and we just finished a, a Houston one. We've been here for a week. So um, just just thank them for closing out um, another chapter of, of this book. Um, wasn't perfect by any means, and there's a lot of things we need to learn and grow from. But, you know, nobody else is, is living the life that they're living right now, and their attitudes and their character throughout this has been exceptional. I, I, I can't imagine being that age and handling kind of what they've been through with the perseverance and, and class that they have. And, and I just told them thank you. And, and our staff as well, um, their families, um, everyone that's kind of gone through what we've been through. We have one more chapter now before Christmas, so we're leaving for Boise tomorrow. That'll be, you know, kind of a week over there of the, the same thing we've kind of been going through. And now we have to just try and finish this next one as, as best as we possibly can. So um, we're going to work on this game and clean up this game, but just big picture wise, I wanted to, to thank them for all their efforts so far. They've represented themselves very well uh, on and off the court. And now we're kind of going into a stretch here for Christmas of, of one more set. And, and hopefully we, we do the same thing we've been doing along the way. Hey, Coach Hunter Green here. Congratulations on finishing uh, these three games. I mean, you guys are fortunate just to have some games before conference play. Give me kind of the big picture, your overall takeaway after playing these three games? Yeah, I mean, you, you want to watch the film and reflect on some things. It, it's hard to not look past your point to, you know, you get a text message this morning because we tested yesterday and, and everybody's negative. And, it's, you know, that's your, that's your biggest fist pump of the day, to be honest with you, that 
um, everyone's negative, and you get and you get to play today. So we're we're very lucky to have gotten the three in that we've gotten in. There's so many people that have played a hand in that um, in and around our school at, at UNM. So many great people that have that have made this opportunity happen, and then obviously people in other places, and, and this one's Rice University for allowing us the opportunity to kind of play games here. So um, that that's your immediate reaction. Right. Just thankful and appreciative to even have had these opportunities to play. Um, I think, like I've said over and over again, the, the the time that we have had with the guys, we've really kind of stressed rebounding and, and not wanting to get too far behind in that area whenever it went live for us, that we would just get swallowed up on the glass and not uh, embrace the physical part of that play because, you know, we haven't had a lot of physical contact since last March. So uh, I think these three games we have rebounded the ball very well or, or as well as I would have liked um, given all the other circumstances. And I think offensively and defensively we – we still have a ways to go. Uh, we, we, we have work to do on both ends of the court, but I think the guys have, have played hard. I think they understand what we're trying to do and, and what we want our identity to be about. We just you know, have to keep working and practicing on that in practices and games and, and hope that we can get there as, as quick as we can. Coach, uh, Nolan Dorsey started for you at the beginning of the second half. Uh, what was the thinking there? Yeah, you know, we went into this game just trying to look at, at as mu- at many different things as we could. We uh, started Valdir for the, the first time, just wanted to kind of take a look at that. We worked on some one three one defense. We worked on some two two one zone press. Um, you know, we just kind of looked at it, and we hadn't given them a crack yet. And, you know, in a lot of those situations, you want to give kids – um, opportunities with, with other players that are maybe in a groove. Sometimes when you kind of put a group of guys out together that haven't played very much, it kind of evolves into something that isn't great. And, you know, those kind of opportunities, we, we got it for Isaiah in the last game, and we thought we'd do it for Nolan in this game, just kind of getting them kind of some as much real reps as you possibly could and uh, go back, look at the film, talk to them, and kind of keep growing these young kids as best we can. Byron Matos was a monster. Uh, yes, a smaller lineup that he was facing, but his first career double double. What about his play, coach? Yeah, I think it was good. It, it, it's good for those guys, Valdir and, and Byron especially, to go against double teams and quickness and all that for their long term development. It doesn't always look pretty out there. Um, they, they, they miss some shots you, you'd like them to make, but that kind of quickness and just speed around them is, is good for big men. It's great for their growth and development. It's not always going to be a, another kid your size and weight always on the other side. So I think in the long run, both Valdir and Byron to kind of go through these ups and downs early on of having a great stretch where the ball's always going in and they feel comfortable and confident and then having that stretch where you maybe get a three second in the key or you miss the layup or you turn it over in a double team. is It's just great teaching moments and, and opportunities for them to grow so we feel great about having those guys on our roster and now we just kind of got to get them as caught up as quickly as possible into being able to play at a high level coach you uh, talked about in pregame how executing the offense getting into the offense and executing what you guys wanted seemed like you could have did a better job of that this afternoon although finishing at the rim was a challenge is it because of the the, the, the speed of the of the defense yeah, I, I'd love to. I, I thought early in the game there was a little bit too much over over the top kind of in transition passes that just put us in some quick spots. We either turned it over or just took some quick ones. I think the second half we only had three turnovers. I thought it was a little bit better, um, just as far as valuing the ball a little bit more. Our percentages were a little bit better overall in the second half as well, not not by a landslide. But we did we did miss some around the rim today. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, we we kind of shortchanged some stuff. I thought Byron and, and Valdir in particular just kind of took quicker kind of, you know, slingshot, just quicker shots as opposed to really lifting and extending and going towards the rim on their finishes. So I think hopefully going forward it'll be great film for them to, to kind of understand. And, again, I just think smaller, quicker guys um, pose some different problems for those guys that maybe they're not used to playing against each other every day. So, you know, a combination of youth, uh, inexperience, 
um, not only in experience maybe on the court, but just with live contact play and, and working through there's somebody else on the court right now trying to stop you as opposed to, you know, workouts and, and situations where there's kind of nobody else there playing live contact. So I'm hopeful as the season progresses, a lot more of those will go in. And it's not a, it's not a talent issue as much as it is just experience and, and going against other people in live play. Coach, we're, your team was 10 of 13 uh, from the foul line in the first game of the season against Rice uh, in a game that was tight, in a game where you needed them. These last two games, the free throw shooting has not been good. Concerning or just still very, very early and, and don't put too much stock in it? Yeah, pr- I mean, probably somewhere in the middle of that. Um, a little bit of the last answer, you know, again, just, just getting some reps under your belt of, of live play and getting to the free throw line and having to execute that in a real game as opposed to, you know, not, not in a real game. Uh, a little bit of experience. A lot of these guys are going to the free throw line for the first time in their, in their college careers and just working through that, making sure that they're following their, their, their pre-shot routine, going through all the tendencies and keys we give them when they get to the line and working through it. I'm hopeful that it's not going to be an issue, just like I just mentioned on the layups, but it's hard to not watch that game and think, uh-oh, we we, we got to make sure we pay more attention to it. So um, hopeful it, it, it's a combination of the, the, the previous things I brought up, but we'll still do our due diligence and coach and, and develop these guys through it. The 79 rebounds is a program record, Coach. I know you put a huge emphasis on that um, going into this first week of competition. Uh, you're going to face a lot bigger competition starting next week, obviously. But uh, happy with the way the team has responded to, to sort of that, the importance that you've placed on that in preparation for this first week of play? Look, I think any team you coach, regardless of your talent level or even your coaching expertise, it's a lot more about buy-in than it is the, the, the latter part of that. And I think so far the buy-in has been awesome. So uh, they're buying into doing what we're trying to do as a team. Rebounding has is, is been our, our number one thing, and them going out and doing it the way we want is, is a testament to them as young men and trying to do what the coaches are asking them to do and following a game plan. And I think the good thing now is the errors that we're making are not them not trying to do what we want to do. It's just maybe the quickness of the game or just getting in those live experiences and maybe kind of forgetting what you're supposed to do or not doing it because you you don't quite have the confidence on the court yet as opposed to coach really wants me to do this, but – you know, I think this might be more important. So that's very comforting to, to have a group like that so far as a coach, and we just got to keep keep developing them, and, and hopefully the rebounding will be a, a, a great trend for us the rest of the year. I got one more question, Coach. In terms of lessons learned you know, out of these three games, what was the brightest spot for you um, throughout these three games? You know, I would. I told the guys after the game. I think the brightest spot is just in their their body language, their energy, their enthusiasm. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons to kind of hang your head for 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 various purposes right now. And I I took a lot from them just as far as having a great attitude and going out and playing the game that you love and playing it as hard as you can. Maybe not perfect. Maybe not exactly where we want it to be. But if, if, I, if I took any lessons from them, it's like, you know what, we have a team that does want to work hard, that does want to play hard, that cares for each other, you know, just kind of embodies the things that we want to be about, we want this team to be about. So that was very encouraging to me. It's not easy to play the amount of guys we play. It's not easy to not play and, and have a star player or run plays for this guy or run plays to that guy. We, we've really tried to get them to buy into a team concept where it's about our depth and our, and our rebounding, and, and there is no star player and there is no focal point and there is no special considerations. It's, it's literally top to bottom are, are equal, and they're all going to get opportunities, and we're going to do things um, for better or for worse as a team and and they've done that so i i'm i'm very very encouraged by that now we just got to coach them up and, and keep growing and developing our encore product so that that can even be a bigger strength for us than it is right now coach if i may quickly the in leading into conference play next week the conditioning and health of your team you know we know that there are two 
uh, players that, that have major injuries in their history in, in Valdir Manuel with the, the wrist and the knee for Jeremiah Francis. How are they doing and, and how are they feeling? And, and we know that Jordan Arroyo and Hassan Injai were back home in Albuquerque, just joined you, haven't been practicing with you guys this week. So in terms of where you are in, in preparation and in health for next week, uh, where is where are the Lobos at this point? How happy are you with where they are? Yeah, I think in the short run, I, I wouldn't have done anything different. Uh, we've we've been very cautious about putting them in situations where maybe they get overextended. I think if you look around the country, there's been a lot of, of pretty significant injuries, particularly to the lower body, as these teams have kind of gotten back and maybe done too much too soon. And we've been very patient and cautious as soon as we were cleared that we did not overextend anybody in a way that might make them more susceptible to an injury. Uh, even when we got back kind of into our training camp, there was opportunity possibly to, to play games, and we didn't do it. We, we just didn't think that was the right thing to do for the kids, to put them in a situation where maybe they're playing a lot of minutes right off the bat and, and something might, might happen that you don't want. So we've, we've, we've I think, done everything we, we should have done to prepare them. And then really, even though we played the three games in five days, I thought we were very diligent about minutes and making sure that no one particular guy uh, was out more than two media timeouts straight um, and or put himself in a position where we felt it might overextend him to a point where something bad could happen. So, you know, medically, I feel like we've been very responsible. Uh, Our UNM medical team has been great in that. And then we've kind of followed a pretty diligent plan of, you know, it's sexy now to say load management, but just kind of managing these guys and, and their load in that way and being as safe as we possibly can. Now, there's no guarantees, but, but to date, I, I feel like our whole program has operated very ethically uh, and responsibly with regards to taking care of these kids coming back um, from such a long layoff. Well, we're excited to see how they manage their first uh, conference series, if you will. Double header, two games in three days next week in Boise. Congratulations opening the uh, the season with a, a 3-0 and start to your week there uh, in Houston. And uh, safe travels to Boise, get settled in there and get ready for conference play. It's amazing, but a 20-game schedule is ahead of you now, and um, it's upon us. It's it's uh, it, it took so long to get started, and now it's here. That, that part of it's crazy, isn't it? It is. It's exciting. Uh, you, you can't believe it's already here that you're, you're starting league play. It feels like we, we just began, but it is exciting. And the guys were incredibly excited for our games this week, and I expect them to be just as much, if not more so, excited for next week. Coach Weir, thank you very much, and, and we'll talk to you uh, in Boise next week. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Coach. Low boy Coach Paul Weir, our guest, New Mexico 90, Letourneau 58, final school. Okay, let's take a timeout. We come back on the post-game show after this. You're listening to Lobo Basketball on the UNM Sports Radio Network. Watch drives the left baseline. Rises between two defenders. Missed it. Got it back. Goes back up and scores. Malawatch now with 15. That's a game-high total. Lobo lead is 59-36. Malawatch. McQuatch Malawatch's hot play continues for UNM. Today, 15 points and 12 boards. His second double-double. In three games to start the year, he was 6 of 8 from the field, 3 of 4 from the foul line, had three assists as well to go with that uh, points and rebounds double-double. Lobos final score, 90-58, to 58, winners over Letourneau, the Yellow Jackets out of Longview, Texas, to wrap up their three-game stay in Houston, Texas at Rice University's Tudor Fieldhouse. You're locked into the Lobo basketball post-game show. And is brought to you by Downs Racetrack and Casino. Hope to see you soon. Please continue to mask up and stay safe, Lobos. Hey, remember, you can download the Lobos Sports app today to access exclusive content that includes interviews with head coaches Danny Gonzalez, Paul Weir, and Mike Bradbury. Listen to live game broadcasts. Keep up with the latest stats and scores. Enter to win prizes and much more. The Lobos Sports app, it's free. And it can be found on the Apple Store and the Google Store. Download now and go Lobos. New Mexico 90, Letourneau 58 is the final. Some uh, stats to get to you. Lobos shoot 46% from the field. That's 38 out of 83. Letourneau 28%, 27 out of 79. New Mexico just 2 of 12 from distance. They missed their first 10, and then they made their last 2. The Lobos 17% from 3-point land. Letourneau 11 out of 44 from 3. That's 25%. New Mexico... 
12 of 24 from the free throw line, 50%. That's after they shot 10 out of 23 on Tuesday against Our Lady of the Lake. Um, is two games a trend? Uh, I guess we'll find out on Monday in Boise. The Lobos turned it over 15 times total, but in fact just a couple of times in the second half after struggling a little bit, uh, especially in transition, uh, being a little loose with the ball in the first half, double-digit first-half turnovers, uh, but they were able to cut it to three in the second half. Uh, the Lobos dominate the glass 79-32, to 32, and they pull 32 offensive rebounds to 11 for Letourneau. It translated to second chance points, 37, excuse me, 34 to 7. The Lobos win second chance points. And, of course, that uh, also translated to a huge paint points advantage, 68 to 20. Lobos win the bench points, 45-13. And uh, New Mexico assisted 16 times uh, on uh, their made field goals, while Letourneau just 10. Welcome back, my broadcast partner, Lobo legend Hunter Green. I'm Robert Portnoy. And Hunter, um, You've gotten to see uh, some of these guys now uh, in game action for the very first time. The Lobos, as we know, a ton of new faces, um, literally 10 of them, 10 new faces. Right. 12 of them uh, hadn't played a single minute for the Lobos coming into this scene, 12 out of the 18 yep. on the entire roster. So, um, you know, I, I like to say at the beginning of this week, we're going to get eyes on the Lobos for the first time. What do your eyes tell you after three games so far? Uh, we we got, we got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're young. We're we're really green um, in terms of just experience at the, at the D1 level, um, and just got to work. There's a lot of work to be done, um, just from skills, uh, and you know, just from a skill standpoint, um, just you know, just on all aspects of the game. To be honest with you. Uh, I understand Coach is really focused on rebounding because that's those are the things you can control, rebounding and playing solid defense. Um, and that's probably the best. Those are the two areas to really focus on because you can control those. Um, Three-point shooting, um, free throw percentage, you know, you can practice those things, but um, uh, those, are, those are the things you, you really don't have much control of. So, but I just think overall, I mean, I think we're young. Uh, we're green. I think the good thing is I think they all like each other and they all like to work, and there's a good um, chemistry there, as Coach mentioned, their attitude. And, and to me, I think attitude is everything. So um, you, you, you get that sense that that would be the, uh, the hope, if you will, for this team to get better and to achieve better than seventh place in the conference play. Uh, let's think about – what the lineup might look like as well um, when the Lobos take on Boise on Monday night um, in Idaho. Uh, they've, the Lobos, Coach Ware and his staff, they've tinkered with the front court starting lineup just a little bit each game. Um, the first game, the bigs up front for New Mexico were Quatch and Brown, Emmanuel Quatch and Rod Brown. So they kind of started small up front, mm -hmm. right, in the first game of the year. Right. Then Byron Matos got his first start up front for the Lobos in game two that was on Tuesday against Our Lady of the Lake it was Matos and Emmanuel Quach they started up front and then again they tweaked it just a little bit today in terms of what they did in the front court where Rod Brown came back to the starting lineup up front and Valdir Manuel got his first start mm -hmm. in the front court so they're they're changing the combinations a little bit seeing what they have I mean there's been consistency in terms of the minutes played from Rod Brown, the minutes played from Val Manuel, the minutes played from Byron Matos, and the minutes played from Emmanuel Quach. But right. are, they, are they getting a feel for who works best with whom? Are they looking at purely just the matchups and the size and putting you know, two real true bigs out there together or going small? What, what's at play there, and how do you think those types of decisions might be made yeah. moving forward? Well, I think uh, there's two things. One, I think – they're looking at, you know, just matchups, or not matchups, excuse me, the, the starting lineups in terms of who can they play together, you know. Does how they pair up. How they pair up, exactly. Is, is Manuel pair up uh, well with Brown? Right. Um, or does Brown pair up well with Montos? Uh, Montos. So it, it's, I think they're looking at those things. Um, and then, you know, guys have to be comfortable starting because, again, with injury and COVID, um, they want guys to, to have at least – had that experience of starting a game, and I, I think they're playing with those. Those are the two things they're really working with. 
Okay, uh, another question certainly uh, coming in um, was about the point guard position mm -hmm. and, and how it might look, uh, especially behind Jeremiah Francis. I mean, everybody thought they had a pretty good idea that Jeremiah Francis would be the starting point guard. He certainly has been that the first three games. And, you know, obviously uh, he's going to get a lot more work this season than in his previous season at North Carolina. He still is, you know, working his way back uh, to being – the player that he was from the devastating knee injury that he had in high school. Um, so what does the point guard position look behind, look like behind Jeremiah Francis? You know, a lot of people thought, well, Kurt Rickscheider, he's a returner. He got some run there late last season. Mm -hmm. Is he ready to do that? Um, Saquon Singleton played the point um, in his junior college uh, days before he comes to Albuquerque. Okay. He, he's looked good at times on the point, you know. And then we saw, you know, I asked Coach Weir about Nolan Dorsey. And so, they, they're, you know, Isaiah Marin is on the bench there as well. Could one of the young players, you know, move up in, in the sort of the, the pecking order, if you will, in terms of point guard minutes before the season's over? Um, just kind of look into your, your looking yeah. glass yeah. and see what you see. My crystal ball. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, you go with Francis – um, you got to have insurance because Francis hasn't really con uh, finished a, a season. Uh, I mean, he's been injury prone, and and of course with COVID. So I think you can kind of look at the second. Uh, your backup would be probably uh, Singleton uh, at that position. That's kind of where I think they they're maybe feeling more comfortable with him there. I would um, agree. Yeah, and, and then I, I think after that you kind of almost have to go with Patterson. I mean, because these freshmen aren't ready. I mean, just, I mean, especially if you're on the road at Boise, I mean, I think Patterson's got, you know, at least a number, number of D1 practices under his belt. Um, and and he, maybe he won't hurt you as as much uh, because uh, he can take care of the ball. I mean, that's valuing the, valuing the basketball right now is key for, for New Mexico. And, and I think that's where they're going. They're going with conservative and, and, and taking care of the basketball. So that would probably be the, 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 the order in which, after uh, Jeremiah Francis would be Singleton and then Patterson. I like that. That's a great point. It's just the inexperience right. factor, right? And mm -hmm. Patterson takes away a little bit of the uncertainty. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, talking about Jeremiah Francis and the knee injury, um, it bugged him all the way back to the, so uh, the summer before his junior year of high school. I talked to him about it. Um, he initially actually then had an arthroscopy, uh, as he called it, a cleanup done mm -hmm. on the knee. Um, but then the next summer – Prior to his senior season, summer ball, um, again, pain in the knee, finally got the diagnosis of microfracture. Everybody knows about the microfracture portion of the surgery, um, and you can speak to that, and I'd yeah. like to hear about that. We have just a couple minutes left. But he also had what was done, uh, it was called a realignment surgery. He told me that his kneecap was fractionally higher in his leg than in the average person. Mm -hmm. That was causing it to dislocate and that's what led to the microfractures mm -hmm. and that's what led to that you know the realignment surgery actually said it was only about a six month recovery the microfracture almost a year and a half so but he had both of those things done at the same time and he realizes that he's had to make some adjustments in his game since coming back from something like that and you know about the microfracture well my, it depends i mean my my surgery as a microfracture was to help with my um the padding between your in your knee, the uh, the meniscus. The, no, your no. <laughs> man, am I getting old? Yeah, that 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 piece between your 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 knee, your Patella padding. tendon. No, it's no. your it's your padding. Okay, um, it's what Kobe Bryant was in Colorado getting done. We call it microfracture surgery, where they drill holes in your knee above, uh, you know, that padding, which okay. is your. Um, it's all right. The padding, we, right? We so it bleeds down, and yeah. the, the, the blood kind of settles in and scabs and forms as a pad. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we call microfracture surgery. So maybe his is different, but I had the microfracture surgery done to my knee. And, and it worked out, and I was fine. And But it just depends. I think some guys, it uh, depends on how you're built. It depends on how heavy you are. Um, uh, you know, how, how well you could recover from the microfracture surgery. So. All right. Well, we've got a special treat coming up for uh, Lobo fans here in just a couple of moments on uh, this very station. Uh, we're going to have a special edition uh, of Lobo Talk, a signing day Lobo Talk, if you will, with Lobo head football coach Danny Gonzalez. That comes up uh, straight away at the top of the hour. Um, we're going to talk with him 
about the, uh, the, all of the signings. The, the, the Lobos got 20 new freshmen into the fold yesterday um, for National Signing Day. Uh, this is the first class that Coach Gonzalez has brought in uh, to Lobo football where he's had a full run-up in terms of the recruiting process. He'll tell us he only had about a week and a half uh, after he arrived on campus in December of last year uh, to get his first class in. And a lot of those true freshmen actually played, Hunter. It was pretty remarkable. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I love the way they finished the year. It was fun to watch the kid from Rio Rancho, New Mexico, Chavez. I mean, I, I just I really enjoyed watching how they finished up, and especially what they've been through. Uh, now the basketball team's kind of going through, but having to be on the road, and, and man, it's a sacrifice. Amazing stuff. All right, that's coming up next. Your final score, 90-58. to 58, The Lobos knock off Letourneau for my broadcast partner, Hunter Green, my producer and engineer, Mike Vitale, my on-site engineer, Michael Carlisle. I'm Robert Portnoy. Stay tuned.